Hi everyone, I'm Vivek Ayer. Today, I'm going to talk about how we improved the P99 query latencies for a low latency Pino system at LinkedIn scale using a Java heap memory optimization technique that is interning. A little bit about myself before we dive into the technical details of this talk. I'm a software engineer in the online analytics team at LinkedIn, and I am also an Apache Pinot committer. Outside of work, I like to travel and hike. Uh, to show for it, I've summited a couple of California 14er peaks. Okay, so let's start off with briefly introducing Apache Pinot. Pinot is a top level Apache project. It is a distributed real-time analytics data store that is designed to deliver low latency analytics at scale. It follows a Lambda architecture to ingest data. It supports both offline batch data pushes, as well as it can directly consume from real-time stream ingestion sources like Kafka, Pin uh, Kafka Pulsar, Kinesis, etc. It's a columnar data store with some rich indexing support that is well suited for serving low latency analytical queries. Apache Pinot is widely used in the industry. This list is by no means exhaustive, but it gives us a fair idea. Okay, let's briefly touch upon Pinot's architecture before we set up the context for the problem statement and then the various solutions that we explored. So the Pinot architecture contains three major components, the Pinot controllers, the Pinot brokers, and then the Pinot servers. You can think of the Pinot controllers as global metadata managers. They are responsible for managing the rest of the components. They undertake some administrative tasks like managing the retention of data in the system and so on. Pinot brokers are query entry points. They help with parsing and compiling the queries. And Pinot servers are one of the most important components uh, for query processing. They basically host the data of your Pinot tables and they store it in units called segments, which is nothing but a shard of a table. And queries in Pinot are processed using a scatter gather fashion. So the query initially enters through the Pinot broker where it is passed and compiled. The broker then identifies a set of servers that are well suited to process the query. And then the query is farmed out to these servers. The servers do the bulk of the query processing in a distributed fashion. And then they return the results back to the broker where the broker performs one final merge step before returning the results back to the user. It is also important that I touch upon the memory layout of Pinot servers and how they process queries uh, to set up context for the problem statement. So to recap, Pinot servers are the hosts that basically store the data of your Pinot tables. And this data is stored in units called segments, which is nothing but a shard of a table. These segments or shards are stored locally on uh, SSDs or hard drives. And each shard contains multiple column buffers. And this column buffer can represent either the actual data in the columns, or it can actually refer to the indexes of these columns. So these column buffers are either memory mapped, or they are li directly loaded onto the heap. So to give you an idea of how this works pictorially, Let's take an example of a segment, a segment X, and here is the Pinot server JVM memory. It is obviously divided into two sections, the heap memory and then the off heap memory. And in this case here, the segment X contains two columns, column A and column Z. And column A will have multiple column buffers. 
let's say it contains the first index buffer and we've configured this index buffer to be memory mapped. Similarly, the other index buffer for column A is also memory mapped. However, for column Z, we could decide or configure it to directly load it onto the heap. There are a few conditions in which we would load an index buffer or a column buffer onto the heap directly. The first thing is it, the cardinality should be super low such that it fits into the heap memory. And we do this to satisfy some low latency requirements. Now with this problem statement, uh, with this context, let's actually jump to the problem statement. So what is the problem statement here? Our use case of interest is a particular Pino table that contained a string column. And we had a dictionary index configured on the string column. And the configuration of this dictionary index was such that it was to be loaded directly on the heap. Note that whenever we configure a column buffer to be loaded on the heap, this happens initially when the server starts up and then it's maintained in the heap memory throughout the lifetime of the server. And why did we decide to do this? We decided to do this to meet some strict latency SLAs where there were filters on the column. And obviously reading from on heap column buffers is faster than memory mapped reads, which has to page in blocks of data in and out of memory. And what was the consequence of this action? The consequence was that we suffered from some very high JVM heap usage, putting our Pino server hosts at risk of out of memory errors. There was increased GC activity. And then we also saw some spiky P99 latencies. So here are some graphs that show these symptoms in action. The first graph that you're looking at is the P99 query latency graph. We can see that although on average, it stays pretty low at about 30 milliseconds, there are spikes here and there that make it shoot to as high as 100 to 500 milliseconds. The second graph shows the JVM heap usage on these server hosts. We can see that the heap usage percentage is at about 70 to 80 percent, putting these hosts at risk of ohms when there are some large queries that hit the system. And as a logical next step to analyze this problem, we took a heap dump. And we analyzed the heap dump using the JXray tool. By the way, I highly recommend this JXray tool. It proactively identifies some well-known Java memory issues, and it also provides clear, actionable insights to address them. Now, coming back, the heap analysis using the JXray tool showed us that a large percentage of our heap memory, nearly 25%, was being wasted by duplicate strings. So when we dug in further, we noticed that our heap contained a total of 300 million string objects. Of these 300 million string objects, there were 100 unique or distinct strings. And of these 100 unique strings, only 44 million of them contain duplicates. And the JXRay tool also clearly called out that all of these duplicate strings were coming from the on heap string dictionary column that we talked about earlier. So just to explain this a little further, each individual dictionary column buffer will contain only one instance of a string, will, will only contain unique strings. But across these various column buffers in different shards, they were duplicates, and that is what caused this problem. And let's next look at the various solutions that we explored and which solution we finally settled on. The first solution that we explored is um, going into the rabbit hole of JVM tuning. We use the string deduplication setting. So as you all know, this instructs the JVM to optimize heap allocation for identical strings when there are spare CPU cycles. It only optimizes long-lived objects that survive uh, three GC cycles. In our case, that was fine because we are talking about a long-lived dictionary column buffer. This has some limitations. 
This technique only deduplicates the character field of the string object. That means the remaining 24 bytes per object is wasted. It only works with the G1GC algorithm and it only works on strings. However, we did try this approach, but the results were not satisfactory. It actually increased our CPU usage on our server hosts, which negatively impacted query latencies. So we did not go with this approach. The next solution that we explored is the native string interning technique in Java. So Java supports a string interning technique, which basically allows us to use the same memory location for identical strings across the entire JVM. And the way it does this, does this is by maintaining a global cache pool uh, where all these strings are stored. Java string interning again has a number of limitations. As the name implies, it only works on strings. That means if we have column buffers of different data types like a byte array, this cannot be used. Uh, the cache size cannot be controlled. And you are stuck with having one global cache pool across your entire application. And the string interning technique also had a troubled evolution with perf issues in many versions where it crossed the JNI layer, leading to some performance problems. We decided to not go with this, go with this approach just because of the number of limitations it had. The next idea that we explored is using Guava interners. This is the most widely used interning technique uh, in the industry that I know of. And it is implemented using concurrent hash set. It obviously has various improvements over the native Java interning technique. It works on all object types. It supports maintaining isolated caches in your application. And so this was a great candidate, right? And we actually tried it out. So to give you some numbers of how this actually worked for us. So here is the heap usage of the column buffer that we are talking about per shard and across all shards in a server host. So per shard, this particular column buffer occupied 640 megabytes of heap usage and across shards that was 16 GB. After we applied the Guava interning technique to reclaim some heap memory caused by these duplicate strings, which was 13 GB in total, this was the improvement that we saw. We saw that from 16 GB, the total heap usage for this column buffer came down to 11 GB. So this basically tells us that we've reclaimed 5 GB out of the 13 GB that was being used by duplicate strings. But why did it only help us reclaim 5 GB? What about the remaining 8 GB? We wanted to analyze that. And that is when we decided to look at the data characteristics of the column. And when we did that, this is what we found. So across all shards, this particular column buffer had 200 million string objects. And of these 200 million string objects, 100 million of them were distinct. And of these 100 million string objects, a very small portion, 40 million, had duplicates for them. And as you, as you all know, Guava interning technique stores a unique copy for all distinct string objects. And that is why we were able to save only 5 GB of our heap and not the entire 13 GB. And this is where the solution that we eventually used was born. So let me introduce to you the fixed size array lock free interning technique. So this technique was developed by the LinkedIn Java team. Uh, it is a fixed size interning technique implemented using a fixed size array cache. It deduplicates objects opportunistically, which means that not all unique objects necessarily have to be stored. And just like Guava interners, it has the goodness of supporting any given object type. Um, you can maintain isolated caches across your application. Additionally, there is no locking involved when compared to the Guava interner, which means that it's faster. So here is a rough pseudocode of our uh, FALF interner. 
you have to know the initial capacity that you want to instantiate the FALF interner with. And then when you call the intern function on a particular object, we compute the hash and then store it into uh, the hash slot. Note that the hash function here is pluggable. It is important to choose the right hash function that uniformly distributes your objects across the available slots for effectiveness. So analyzing how the FALF interna performs when compared to the Guava interna, the only pain point I can see is that the FALF interna requires you to provide an initial estimated capacity for the array cache. This can be a little problematic for different applications, but in our case, we were able to come, we were able to overcome this by profiling the data characteristics of our column. In terms of performance, the FALF interner is about 2x faster than the Guava interner, but it's about 40% slower than no interning at all. In our case, we pay this cost of 40% increased performance only once at server startup, but we don't, but during query processing, this performance is not, uh, doesn't come into play. So we were good on that front. And now let's look at how this worked out for us. So for the outcome highlights, here is the JX-ray analysis before we applied the interning technique. As we saw before, there was 13 GB of wasted heap space. After we applied the interning technique, we were able to reclaim about 12 GB of our heap space as compared to just 5 GB that Guava interning gave us. This also translated pretty well in terms of improving our query latencies because of reduced GC activity and CPU utilization. The first graph here is the graph we looked at earlier. We were seeing uh, CPU spikes, uh, uh, P99 query latency spikes that were causing our P99 query uh, latencies to shoot up to as much as uh, 100 milliseconds. However, after we applied the interning technique, the graph below shows us that uh, we did not see these spikes any longer and the P99 query latencies may be shot up to as much as 27 to 28 milliseconds. That pretty much concludes what I wanted to discuss with you all today. Thank you again for patiently listening to this talk. Uh, here are my socials. Uh, I also look forward to more people using Apache Pino and contributing to our open source community. Thank you again.